Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. We're continuing on in Unit 4, discussing political organizations of space. And today we're going to be talking about some of the very basic terminology and basic vocabulary of political geography, really to give us a foundation of how we can accurately discuss political geography within the context of the course. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the most basic of all the fundamental units of political geography, and that is the state. Now, when we think about states, especially living in the United States, typically we think of the state as the subset of the larger country, a lar larger nation, or uh, something along those lines. Within political, geog political geography, uh, the state has a little bit different meaning. So in this, con just kind of for ease of, of understanding, think of the state as the country. Pretty much when we say state in political geography, we mean a country. So how do we define what a state is? Well, a state is a territory that contains a permanent population, recognized boundaries, I guess recognized and established boundaries, a, an effective government, and I guess it depends on what you mean by effective government, a working economy, sovereignty, but is also a state that is recognized by other states uh, in the world and other states around it. Now that term sovereignty means the ability to control its own a countries or a state's ability to control its own affairs, its own institutions, uh, and Pretty much it just has control over its territory and its population. Uh, so I have a couple of images here, just some funny, interesting ones from around the world. We have Western, well I guess Western Sahara isn't funny, um, but we have the, the situation in Western Sahara, and of course there are people living in Western Sahara who believe it's a separate country, but it's this recognition issue that Western Sahara has. Uh, of course, uh, Morocco does not consider Western Sahara to be a separate country, um, but it considers to be a part of uh, Morocco, so Western Sahara has that issue of being recognized by others. Then there's the country of Sealand, uh, which is kind of an interesting political geography anomaly sitting off the coast of England. Um, and actually, Sealand, I guess, has, as far as I've read, has established its independence, has minted its own currency, has its own government, things like that, and has and uh, actually been recognized as independent by English courts. Uh, so kind of an interesting situation there. So you notice all of these things, and really, in order to be a recognized state, you have to have kind of all of these things together. Uh, but this sovereignty and recognized by others is really interesting, especially when it comes to uh, which states will or will not recognize other states. And you see that kind of the larger uh, political sphere uh, around the world, and especially countries that maybe don't get along with each other, and how they will or won't recognize uh, the legitimacy of, uh, of a country. We look at some of the newest created countries in the world like South Sudan. You know, when South Sudan becomes a country, uh, other states around the world actually have to go in and recognize that particular state. And you look at some of the different independence movements from around the world, uh, whether it be the Basque movement or you look at um, you know, the separatists, separatists in Catalonia or things like that. Um, you know, some uh, you actually have instances where they you know, if they could gain recognition from others, they might have an easier time um, gaining their independence. But of course, uh, it would be difficult to uh, to do that with Spain and uh, in the relationship that a lot of countries have with Spain. Uh, you know, same thing with like Tibet and the western portion of China. Uh, they'd have to establish uh, recognition from other countries, and that might not, that might not uh, that might be something that's rather difficult uh, for them to do. So it's it's this idea of collaboration and working together. Which you can't just really. You guess you could declare yourself your own independent country, um, but you have to have it recognized by other countries in order for it to be legitimate. And then I guess maybe the interesting kind of side note might be: Well, would you would we consider ISIS and the territory it uh, covers to be an actual state because they they have territory? I'm not exactly sure what kind of government they have, but they they essentially govern the territory. They have they're printing a currency. They're selling oil to other countries, so they're making money, so they're having a working economy. Um, and they're certainly not recognized by uh, by others around the world, uh, but they, you know, they pretty much have all those other things in play, and so uh, definitely an interesting situation to, to watch uh, as, as the events unfold. Some other important terms we need to uh, be familiar with is the nation. Now this is where things get a little bit tricky, and we need to throw our old understanding of the world and vocabulary out the window. Basically, a nation and some of you learn about this in, uh, in the ethnicity chapters of your textbook, but I talk about it in the uh, political portion. The nation is a, a group of people. So don't think of it as a political unit. Think of it as a group of people who have a common culture and or identity. 
Uh, so their cultural characteristics are similar. A lot of times, the, if we consider a group of people a nation, they also have a common history. They also occupy a common territory. And so, uh, you know, some people were asking in class, well, what's the difference? Between, well, how can an ethnicity move into a nation? Well, really, when you talk about the nation, people who are a part of a nation have a desire uh, to move beyond just a common identity, but move into a common, not just a common cultural identity, but then a common uh, political identity. And so they want to create some sort of they, some sort of political unity out of the group that they're a part of. And so that's really where ethnicity and nation kind of uh, are, are a little bit different. Because again, eth ethnicity, we have the, the common uh, culture and the common identity. But the nation is, you know, it's about territory, it's about control, it's about political activeness and, and things along those lines. And so when we talk about the nation, excuse me, I'll go back. We have, I mean, we have nations of people all over, all over the world. And there are some who are vying for their own political units in the United States. We think, we, we think about the different native populations that would be considered nations um, and the, the Indian reservations that are separate from the United States. Um, so they have press for, uh, for, for I guess it's kind of like a quasi-independence uh, that the reservations have in the United States because they're separate. Um, uh, they're, kind of, they're considered like foreign territories within the United States and those are nations of people that, are, that have come together. And of course not all of them have um, not all of them have uh, independence, these nations that are around the world, and we'll talk more about that in just in, uh, later on in the unit. Uh, <clears throat> we also have uh, instances, or actually not also, but you know, most instances in the world we have what are called multicultural states or multinational states. So of course those are they have states that have multiple nations or multiple ethnicities within them. And so really uh, this would be the most common instance around the world is where you have uh, a country that has multiple groups of people living within it. Now, the move after uh, after World War One really was to create this this notion of the nation state uh, in order to alleviate uh, a lot of the uh, the ethnic tensions and violence that we've seen around the world. Uh, allow people that idea that Woodrow Wilson talked about um, the idea of self determination, where these nations of people could create their own their own state. And so that's where you get you know, balkanization begins to happen. Of course, it happens after World War II, but um, you know, you, you start seeing these countries kind of fragment off into smaller pieces. And so, uh, you know, but for the most part, prior to that, we had these multicultural, multinational states. Of course, the United States would be a great example of that, all these different groups of people residing within the United States. And of course, you can think about some of the conflict that that would create. And again, you look back at that in the ethnicity section of the course, um, you know the problem with uh, the problem with all these ethnicities kind of living near and around each other, uh, in terms of their lack of understanding or their conflict with each other, and of course, hoping hoping we can move forward to a time where uh, the ethnicities and the different groups of people and the nations can live near each other, next to each other, uh, among each other without uh, without the conflict. So now we're on to our first quiz ferret. So Quiz Ferret has popped his fuzzy head out of the ground and he has a question for us. So what is your question, Quiz Ferret? What is the difference between a nation and a state? And that's a great question because that's what we just uh, that's just what we just went over. So pause the video for a second, write down uh, the definition between the, dif uh, the difference between the two, and uh, see if you get it right. So hopefully you pause the video, and so the the definitions or the correct definitions would be a nation is a group of people with common cultural attributes. And a state is a basic political unit that divides human territory. And then, of course, you talk about things like uh, sovereignty and the government and the economy and those types of things. So thank you, Quiz Ferret. We look forward to seeing you next time. It's a great question. And now in some uh, portions of the world, we do have what's considered to be a nation state. And this is what I was referring to just a few minutes ago. Uh, in the nation state, I mean, you have to look at the word and the way it's put together, this idea of nation state. So we're talking about a state, really that is comprised mostly of one nation. And so within the nation state, you would get uh, a relatively homogenous cultural landscape. Uh, and so this doesn't really take place much around the world because the way that different groups of people have moved around and inhabited similar territories. So this would be very difficult to get this homogenous cultural landscape. Now you can find many countries around the world where the predominant population is of one ethnicity. Uh, you know, we might consider that to be a nation state, uh, especially if it's high, like in the you know, the 90 to 95 percent range. Uh, but again, it's still, it's still being very, uh, very difficult to find a country, any country around the world, that is just uh, one 
a particular nationality. Of course, uh, the country, a country like Japan, because of its protection of culture and protection of population, its isolation in terms of the island, would be, might be a good example of a nation state. Also, Korea, the Korean Peninsula, uh, you know, very similar situation. Uh, I don't know. If the Koreans are as protective of their culture, but you know, they've kind of uh, they're kind of off there by themselves. Uh, surrounded by the ocean, their only uh, connection, their land connections through China. So maybe, uh, maybe a similar situation where you have two uh, two countries that are predominantly inhabited by one particular uh, culture. Uh, and again, if you look down at Eastern Europe, that's another great example. I don't think I have a map here of that, and I apologize. Maybe I should put one up. Um, most countries in Eastern Europe, it's actually Southeastern Europe. Look at uh, the idea of Balkanization. Um, where these countries started to split up along uh, cultural lines, and so you established uh, you established countries that are predominantly one particular ethnicity. Uh, so again, it's going to be very difficult to find any country on the world that has just one ethnicity living within it or one nation living within it. Um, but you could find several instances around the world where you have a heavy majority of one particular ethnicity. So that's all we're going to do for today. Uh, when we come back next time, we're going to look at some other terminology, uh, especially. Uh, term terminology that leads us to some of our current conflicts in the world, like the idea of the stateless nation. So I hope uh, to see you next time, and I look forward to uh, working with you again shortly.